Hello, today is April 9th, 2012. We're meeting with Mr. Joe Graham at his, at his son's home in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Joe, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. It's a pleasure. Let's start out, if we could. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Well, let's see. I was born September 30th, 1917, in the Passaic, New Jersey General Hospital. I think I was the first among, first and only one among the four children who were born in the hospital. The others were all born at home. So you were the youngest then? Yes. Okay. And we lived in Rutherford, New Jersey, which is a uh, basically a bedroom community uh, in northern New Jersey for people who live in the, who work in New York but would rather not live there. Uh, lovely community. I was pleased to be raised there. And uh, well, let's see what else we do. I had two older brothers uh, and a sister with whom I have always been very close. Uh, uh, and a mother that could hardly be beaten anywhere in the world. She was a wonderful woman. Wow, wow, wow. What did your father do for a living? He had been an, ex an extremely successful man. He inherited a drayage business, a uh, horse and wagon, uh, from his father. And uh, he and his brother George uh, uh, ran the Graham Brothers drayage business, but they were the first New Yorkers to switch from horses to what to, to trucks. They were extremely successful, um, and I'm not talking against my father when I say this. He had a certain penchant for the grape, uh, and um, he also had an eye for the ladies, um, and the fortune that he amassed disappeared. Uh, and uh, we lost the house, we lost both of the cars, we never did own a house again. Uh, to my father's credit, after my mother had what I bet you could call a constructive chat with him uh, about the ladies of the booze, uh, he never touched a drop again, and he would do anything honest to put bread on the table for the family. Mm. He was a good provider. Wow. Uh, so, that's basically the family. Yeah. Well, uh, one question I'd like to ask uh, your generation uh, before we get into your military experience was, uh, tell us about your memories of, and was your family affected by the Great Depression? Indeed, we were. Um, since my father was now an employee rather than empl an, em an employer, uh, he was trying to be a truck driver during the Depression. And uh, I, re I remember that they, his boss apparently tried to shift it around so that my father might work one or two days a week and the other guys would also work one or two. Nobody got fired, which was what a lot of employers tried to do during the Depression. He probably was then making maybe 20, $30 a week, maybe. Uh, my sister had a pretty good position with the Federal Reserve Bank in New York and was making twenty-seven fifty a week, I remember. Uh, my brother Walter was trying to sell life insurance during the Depression and nobody wanted to buy it. Uh, and uh, my brother George worked for the Public National Bank and he was probably making about 19 bucks a week. I remember sitting at the dinner table one evening and my mother said, Joe is about to get out of high school. That means another $10 a month to the Erie Railroad to get you to Hoboken and then to New York. Uh, we could rent a home in, in, in Brooklyn for $40 a month and uh, we, would, we would have four commutation tickets and that's 40 bucks that we would have to be spending. So we moved to Brooklyn. Is that right? Before, I was graduated from high school uh, and uh, bless my mother's heart, she went to Mr. Moore, the principal of the school, and said the family's moving and we actually were moving out of the state. But I would dearly love for Joe to be able to finish with his high school class. Uh, and uh, bless Mr. Moore's heart, he said, Mrs. Graham, I haven't heard a word you said. 
So uh, I was permitted to stay with my class. And they put me in a, in a boarding house. Uh, that's where I got my boarding house reach. <laughs> and uh, stayed there till graduation day. Uh, and uh, put my diploma under my arm. And my mother and my aunt and my sister and I walked down Park Avenue in Rutherford got on the Erie Railroad, and we left town. Oh, uh, good Talk about traumatic experience. <laughs> uh, so what year then did you graduate from high school? That was 1935. 1935. And take your story from there. After high school, where'd you go? Uh, well, I went to, to, I was an honor student in high school, I'm proud to say. Uh, and uh, it took me nine months to find a permanent job. You, you ask, were we affected by the Depression? You bet we were. Uh, I finally got a job with the Travelers Insurance Company in their Brooklyn office as their office boy. And I remember when Mr. E. Prescott Hills, the assistant manager of the office, hired me. He said, well, we pay you, we'll pay you $15 a week. Uh, and these are the duties. And it was a list about that long. You'll never get a raise, and you'll never be promoted. At the end of your at the end of two years, we will ask you to leave because we want office boys and not office men. Uh, and uh, I enrolled at New York University as a night school student, wanting to be a teacher. Uh, Mr. Harold O'Dell, the history teacher, the civics teacher, the ba baseball coach, and the soccer coach. And Miss Edith Fletcher, my homeroom teacher, and my English and English literature, English literature teacher, really inspired me. I wanted to be a high school teacher, and uh, I enrolled at NYU with that as my goal. And uh, I worked hard. And uh, despite what Mr. Hills had originally told me, he called me to his desk one day and said, "We have something in mind for you." and we're thinking of asking you to go into the underwriting department. They promoted me, and I got a raise. <laughs> but I remember telling him, old honest Joe, gosh, Mr. Hills, I'm not the least bit interested in insurance. <laughs> I want to be a teacher, and that's why I'm going to school. <laughs> Dumb but honest. <laughs> he said, try it, which I did, and I liked it. And I spent 44 years in the insurance business before and after the war. Yeah. So uh, moving ahead then, uh, we'll get into your military experience. Uh, Pearl Harbor Day, do you remember where you were and, and what you were thinking when you heard the news? Yes, I was in the Army. Oh, you already were in the Army? Yes. Were you part of the pre-war uh, yeah. draft? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, part of the pre-war draft, but I volunteered for the draft. Uh, I felt that the corporation and their, the travelers is a huge corporation. We're taking advantage of the draftees. Uh, others were being moved ahead uh, because they could plan on them and they couldn't plan on us draftees. Uh, so I wanted to get my year over with and I uh, drafted, I think I volunteered in June of 41 and uh, went through my pre-induction physical, and, my, and that, that's the real kicker. I was a pretty naive kid. I was 24, had my pre-induction physical at uh, Governor's Island out in New York Bay. Went to the usual dentist and the internist and all that business. And the last one was the psychologist. And he asked me a bunch of questions, including, which would you rather be with the guys or the, or the guy, or gals? And I'd rather be with the guys. And the questions started coming. <laughs> I didn't know what he was talking about <laughs> at 24. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, I was inducted on September 2nd, 41, three, more than three months before Pearl Harbor. Right. And where were we in Pearl Harbor? The only person I knew uh, in the many, many draftees that left the reception center at Fort Dix and went for, to Fort Knox for the tank training, the Armored Force Replacement Training Center is the proper word, uh, 
was a man by the name of Ken Mc, Ed, 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 Ed McAllister. Uh, everybody likes Ed McAllister, lovely guy. He had been best man at my sister's wedding, so I knew Ed well. Wow. Uh, he signed up on the very first weekend that we were permitted to go to town from Fort Knox to at the U.S. Would you like to have Sunday dinner with a local couple? And Ed thought that would be a nice idea. Well, he went to the home of Mr. and Mrs. John S. Pito in the Indian Hills section of Louisville. Lovely people. They liked Ed. Everybody did. Come back next week and bring a friend. Come back next week and bring another friend, Ken McNichol. Uh, and uh, we spent every Sunday with the uh, with the Pitos with a southern fried chicken dinner. Where Mrs. Pito got the butter with all the rationing that was going on, I have no idea. But we were in their living room on Pearl Harbor Day and listening to the radio and just talking with these lovely people, as we did every Sunday. Uh -huh. uh, I thought I heard something, and uh, I'm usually a fairly polite guy. I said, shut up, listen to this. Uh, and it was the Pearl Harbor an announcement. And uh, the usual, all military personnel returned to base. So that, that started the real army. Yeah, yeah. We had finished our basic training the day before Pearl Harbor. Wow. And how was it? How was that transition going for you going from civilian life into military life? You wouldn't believe this. Um, I was 24 when I was drafted. Uh, I have never driven a car in my life. Typical New York kid. Sure. Yeah. Couldn't afford one. Yeah. Didn't need one. Right. You put a nickel in the turnstile and you went wherever you wanted yeah, to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, I also had a reputation among my siblings for total mechanical ineptitude. <laughs> when the, my brother drove me to the Long Island Railroad to ship me off to be drafted, I thought the funniest thing he could think of was, you know, you know, kid, he slapped me on the knee. With your mechanical ineptitude, I bet they put you in a tank outfit. <laughs> <laughs> Which is exactly what they did. The first thing I ever drove in my life was a tank. Wow. <laughs> I've been accused of driving an automobile like that ever since, but uh, uh, I was probably the most ill-prepared man to get into a tank outfit. Well, how did you get, you any idea how you got chosen into the tanks? Um, I was probably 38th on a list of 50 guys that they needed to send to Fort Knox. Oh, okay. Uh, the, the Army's great classification system. Right. An insurance underwriter during the day, yeah. uh, a NYU student at night, ideal for a tank. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I'm glad I did. I liked the Harvard Force. Really? Yeah. And uh, I was really fortunate to be put into B Company of the 5th Battalion of the Armored Force Replacement Training Center because it was run by a Captain Roy Billingsley, uh, Leroy Billingsley, uh, who kind of took me under his wing. Uh, the Army was ill-prepared for the ocean, the, the tidal wave of draftees that were heading their way. Their instructors were ill-prepared. They were terrible. Uh, and. Uh, the three I mentioned before, Ken McNichol, Ed McAllister, and I, we got green armbands. And at the end of three weeks, this guy with a mechanical ineptitude that had never driven a car, I'm an instructor. Really? <laughs> the, the, the Army was in that, how did we win the war? <laughs> um, but I was kept as an instructor uh, after our basic training. The others were all sent off to, uh, I think, Fort Lewis, Washington, and... Uh, well, you obviously must have excelled at it then to, to be... Ch you must have excelled at the program to, to, to be kept back for as an instructor. Well, I... We were better than what Captain Billingsley had, let's put it okay. that way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, 
I stayed, I like to say, the lifelong basic training. I've had to take it three more, to take it over three more times as an instructor. Uh, it did give me a little command experience. Uh, we had to study our field manuals, so we learned our various subjects. Uh, it was a riot. Graham, 10 o'clock tomorrow. You're teaching map reading. I am. <laughs> I'd never seen an army map before. We, we must have been terrible instructors, but we did the best we could. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Ken was a uh, Columbia, uh, a foreign graduate, and Ed McAllister was a, was a Columbia graduate, and I was an NYU student, and uh, we did our best. Uh, but then I went to OCS uh, at Fort Knox, uh, and it was the Armour OCS, uh, and uh, I guess I did well. I was honored to be uh, the platoon sergeant uh, at, the, at the graduation exercises. And uh, Mr. and Mrs. Pito pinned my second lieutenant bars on me. Oh, I'll be tired. Uh, and uh, we were transferred <clears throat> right across the parade grounds to the brand new, just being formed, 781st Tank Battalion. Um, actually, we were hand-picked. Um, we were out of formation, oh, about two weeks before we finished OCS. And along came this nifty-looking Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, and uh, all men with tank experience, two steps forward. This is the tank OCS. About six of us stepped forward. Isn't that a shame? Hmm. Uh, and uh, he interviewed each one of us, and he did that with other classes. And he handpicked about 18 brand new second lieutenant 90 day wonders. And I was fortunate, and I mean this, to be among them. The colonel with his handpicking of the second lieutenant was equally brutal in his weeding out of what he felt might have been the misfits of the officers that he had been given. So uh, we second lieutenants had, had great opportunity for advancement because a lot of the captains got fired. <laughs> well, well, he had never got fired in the army. Uh, with the glowing commendation, he got transferred someplace <laughs> <Yeah>. else. <laughs> um, the 781st, was not a combat outfit in its original days. Uh, we were a civilian outfit. Um, our first assignment was to work for the Armored Force Board, uh, and uh, our job was to test tanks. Would you believe, here it was in 1940, early 43, the Army still did not have a design for the Sherman tank to give to Detroit and say, build this. Really? Oh. Um, and that was our job. So they gave us 40 tanks, 10 from General Motors, 10 from Ford, 10 from Chrysler, and 10 from Light, like Homing. And we were to drive the tanks 24 hours a day, seven days a week for five months. So we had shifts. Uh, you were on the eight to four shift, or the four to 12 shift. Uh, and uh, it was like having a civilian job. Uh, and we recorded everything. Uh, we were told that the 781st did a very commendable job. We were given thanks by the Armored Board. Uh, and we told them that the best tank was the General Motors diesel tank. So they put the, the Ford gasoline tank. But there was a reason for that. Uh, the General Motors diesel was the superior tank, but the petroleum industry couldn't produce enough diesel fuel for the Navy and for the, uh, for the Armored Force, so we had to take okay. the high-test gasoline that blew up every time we got hit overseas uh, and uh, incinerated us. But, uh, the rest of the tank was what we had said this is what we think you ought to have. Uh, so we finished that job, and uh, 
we were then to be transferred um, or re remodeled into a uh, into a combat outfit. We didn't have the right kind of formation. We we have three tanks, three tank companies, headquarters, and service, and uh, we were to become a standard tank battalion. Three Sherman tank companies, one light tank company. That's one of the few mistakes the colonel ever made, uh, and it was an opportunity ultimately for me. Uh, he said to the company commanders. Uh, send qualified men to Lieutenant Kaiser, who will be forming D Company, our new life tank company. I was then the executive officer of C Company, and I can remember telling Dave Kelly, hey Dave, here's our chance to get rid of Kowalski. <laughs> and D Company got a pretty fair share of Kowalskis. It also got a pretty fair share of very capable men. But unfortunately, the Kowalskis flavored the company. And poor Bill Kaiser, who was the company commander, was dead before he started. The guys would not cooperate. With the mess ups of the battalion, we're going to act like it. And no matter what Bill did, he couldn't get them to function well. They were known in the battalion as the raggedy ass cadets, very appropriately. Yeah. And finally, Bill was relieved. You know who took his place. Uh, I got the raggedy ass cadets. And I wasn't doing any better than Bill Kaiser. Uh, they were just unmanageable. Dave Kelly, my former boss in C Company, and I were at the country club, or the officers club, I should say, having a sandwich and a beer. And we were in the pool when the officer of the day came. Graham, get out of the pool. Your company's being detached from the battalion and sent out of the country on a secret mission. The raggedy ass cadets. Yeah, Clemens, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Graham, I mean it. Get out of the pool. Get your company together. I wouldn't move. I, <laughs> it, it, conceivable. He said, as an officer of the day, I'm giving you an order to get out of that damn pool and get your company together. There are such orders. I said, by God, he means it. Uh, went back in there were the orders. Uh, didn't know where we were going, but it was somewhere in Canada. Um, our job up there ultimately became that we were to work with the Canadians who also had British officers with them, to develop tank infantry attack tactics under dense smoke conditions. Uh, why D Company 781st Tank Battalion was picked, it had to come right out of the air, I don't know. Uh, but somebody in the, in the company said, why us? Because we're the best goddamn light tank company in the United States Army. And they started acting like it. Is that right? I would like to take credit for the transition, but they became overnight one damn good outfit. Huh. Uh, and I got a captaincy out of it, uh, but uh, not until after we finished up in Canada. And the Canadians loved us because they were, we're the only Americans in camp, and we're going to be proud of ourselves, and we're going to make our country proud of us. And they did. Uh, the General Ganong, who was my boss up there, he ran the 6th Royal Canadian Infantry Brigade, um, wrote Colonel Kenny a, a note extolling Lieutenant Graham and his grand lads. <laughs> what a switch! Uh, and they stayed that way. And in combat, they were one hell of an outfit. But, uh, all because somebody said, why us? Huh. <laughs> and, uh, and Lieutenant Kaiser, incidentally, <clears throat> got two silver stars for his excellent leadership overseas. Uh, he was a damn good officer. He, wrong place, wrong time for Bill. <laughs> hmm. We went overseas. Uh, 
after I got back from when we got back from Canada uh, in October of '44, uh, oh. uh, and uh, left for Camp Shanks. Uh, took the train down to Hoboken, the ferry over to Staten Island, and then left in a huge convoy. Well, th that begs the question, here's a, a boy that probably had never gone to sea. Did, did you get your sea legs? Talk a little bit about the crossing. Uh, very, very calm. Uh, there was a baby flat top there with airplane cover frequently during the trip. Uh, there were some submarine warnings and we did some zigzagging, but not as much as we had expected. Uh, I, I would say that from a, from a convoy standpoint, it was one of the, probably one of the most uneventful ones. Uh, when we got to the uh, Straits of Gibraltar, because we were heading for Marseille to join the 7th Army, there was an umbrella of the RAF above us, looking, of course, for submarines in the water. And, uh, Oh, it, it was a relatively uneventful convoy. Oh, okay. It took 14 days. A lot of our equipment was lost. And uh, we ended up on some muddy hillside, just a little bit north of Marseille. And we so, so the invasion of southern France had already, yeah, yeah, had, yeah, already, already yeah. happened, okay. We didn't get into the combat until it was north of Lyon. Oh, okay, uh, okay. Paris had just fallen. Okay. So we were Johnny come lately. Um, we, were, we were on that muddy hillside, I think, for about three weeks. And finally the announcement came out. We've been here for quite a while, and we should have a name for this hillside. And <laughs> this is great. Um, we, want to, we, we want to have the name for the battalion history. And uh, since we haven't gotten our supplies yet, uh, it's likely that we'll be able to give a three-day pass to whoever picks the appropriate name, put your you put your suggested name in the box at the at the battalion headquarters tank. One suggestion was put in: Chicken Shit Hill, and you can stick the pants up your ass. <laughs> the colonel was furious. <laughs> it was rumored. That the one suggestion came from D Company. <laughs> the raggedy ass goodness, and I would not have been surprised. <laughs> but we finally got loaded up onto a train and we went up just north of Lyon. I think the town was Nancy, N A N C Y, uh, and our combat started there. Uh, and we stayed in France all over the Lorraine, Alsace area. Uh, winning some, losing some, uh, uh, until the breakthrough, uh, probably in March of 45. Uh, one episode uh, during the bulge uh, that I like to tell, uh, and it shouldn't be on the, on the tape, but what the Dickens, uh, a couple of my tanks lost their tracks, and uh, or the tanks knocked off with, with the landmines, the road mines, mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, we didn't know where they were. Well, Vinnie Denise, the battalion maintenance officer, and I took it upon ourselves to find them, uh, and uh, we did find them on a hillside, lo looking down uh, on the fortress city of Bish, B I T C H E, and. Uh, we were strolling around looking at the tank and we got fired at. Typical French road, rounded with a ditch on the side. The infantry who had retreated from this position had been in that trench for about four or five days, doing whatever they had to do in the way of urinating, uh -huh. et cetera. And, uh, and uh, Vinnie and I took a dive for it and they, the, the shots kept coming over. Uh, so it was all along the tank to a, the ditch rather to a point where we could make a break for it and we reported <laughs> we reported back to battalion headquarters aroma reeking from us uh, and then he says to the colonel and you know what graham said 
Christ, Denise, there ought to be a better way than this to make a living. <laughs> anyway, we... And this is where the colonel was a real army. He was regular army. Uh, we had to get those tanks out of there. We didn't know it, but we were going to retreat the next day, about 35 miles. Uh, and uh, he said, Captain, you would normally give this job to your maintenance, to Lieutenant Bess, your maintenance officer, but I want you to take the job over. Uh, and I want you to go up there with the, with, the, with the tank retrieval crews and get those tanks back. Now, I don't want them left there. Do I make myself clear? Yes, sir. Uh, and uh, they organized a barrage of artillery on the German side just before the tank retrieval started up. They are extremely loud, and the barrage deadened the noise. Okay. And then we got to a certain point, they put smoke over there, where they couldn't see us hooking the tank retrievers up to the tanks and dragging them off the road. Uh, beautiful. At the very end, one, uh, 188 fired at us, missed us by probably 30 yards. Uh, uh, <laughs> Those 88s were something else from what oh, I understand. Yeah. And then, uh, I know, once I heard that 88, I, I broke all track records getting back to my Jeep, I'll tell you that. Uh, but uh, that, that was a great deal that the Colonel put together. Yeah. And we, we actually did it safely. But we got the tanks and the Germans didn't get them. And that was what the, German, what the Colonel was worried about. Right, right, right. Uh, but what, let's see, that was the bulge. Uh, so were you guys on the, on the southern end of the bulge then, or? Uh... Yes. Okay. Uh, as you know, it's officially known as the Ardennes, mm -hmm. I'll say salient. Most people think of it as being Bastogne, mm -hmm. period. Right, right, uh, okay. We got our tail kicked uh, way down in Lorraine and, and Alsace. Uh, it was, what's it the Germans called? Nordwind, the north wind. They were going to blow us back into the Atlantic. Uh, uh, that's where they really ran out of steam. Uh, shortly after that, uh, we took the town of Bish, which had never been taken before, uh, with the 100th Infantry Division, who called themselves the Sons of Bish. Mm -hmm. And because we were with the 100th so often, we were made honorary Sons of Bish. <laughs> 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 and we were proud to be the 100th and we Got along. So we got along so much that General Burris, after the war, wrote to General Eisenhower and said, if we are ever in a war situation again and the 100th is involved, we want the 781st Tank Battalion with us. Wow. Uh, and uh, uh, we turned out to be a pretty good outfit. Yeah, yeah. We were with five different infantry divisions and one airborne division, the 101st. Uh, for what well, I guess you could call heavy support, and uh, got along with all of them and succeeded, I would say. Our worst fighting uh, came after we got over the Rhine, would you believe? Um, we uh, crossed the Rhine at Ludwigshafen and Mannheim, where we were enjoying the only three days off that we had in the seven days of combat, seven months of combat uh, that we were involved. Uh, we were sitting in a little town called Neustadt. Uh, just nothing to do, great. <laughs> right on the Rhine River. That's a separate story, I'll, I'll digress. Um, the Burgermeister welcomed me. Uh, thank you for liberating us. Uh, spoke pretty decent English uh, and uh, said that in appreciation for the liberation, each officer would get two bottles of wine per day and each enlisted man would get one bottle of wine. They had a wine cellar underneath the entire town. Well, Sergeant Walter, my <laughs> supply sergeant, had been a prison guard at that of our state penitentiary 
in civilian life. And he had learned a few tricks uh, from the inmates. So he stole the truck from the 101st Airborne, took, took their designation on, put, put D Company 781st insignia on it. Uh, and uh, when we left Neustadt the next morning, we had a two and a half ton truck full of, lo loaded with wine. And, and the rest of the war we call the wine tour. <laughs> <laughs> uh, back on the heavy fighting that uh -huh. we had, uh, we were a light tank company, uh, and our mission, uh, for, for the most part, from there on in, was to be in front of the Seventh Army, pursuing a defeated enemy and keeping them on their heels, keeping them from from forming a, no. a base of resistance, and. Uh, However, we, we got to Heilbronn and the Germans really took a last stand. Uh, the civilians came at us with their bare hands and Molotov cocktails. Really? Uh, reason, the RAF had mistakenly bombed, misbombed, firebombed the civilian section of Heilbronn instead of the industrial section. Uh, and those people were justifiably ticked off. Uh, the 100th, when we were with the 100th again, was having a Dickens of a time taking Heilbronn. And after about four or five fruitless days, General Burris decided to take all three regiments and concentrate them in a very narrow section. Uh, and that left five miles of the Necker River undefended. And you know who got it. Uh, they gave it to D Company with our 17 tanks and 114 guys and five miles of river. They augmented, we, we got, they gave me a uh, armored car troop uh, from the reconnaissance section of the 100th. Uh, the colonel gave me a uh, 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 the border platoon and the assault gun platoon from headquarters company. We got an engineer squad. We had about 300 guys for five miles. Two little, two tiny little villages. Couple of great stories. I slept by my radio in the tank. And the very quietly I heard, detail six, this is detail two. What's up, Chartel? 12 man German combat patrol just came over the river. They're south of town. What are your orders? So a load canister ammunition, which made shotguns out of our 37 millimeters. Uh, and uh, full, full load your, your, your machine gun. Fire when you could do it effectively. Quiet. All of a sudden, there are tracer bullets going up in the air. That you could hear the flap of the canister ammunition being fired. Uh, for about 10 minutes, there was a war going on in the other, other, other town. Quiet. Detail. Louder this time. Detail six, this is two. Yeah. What's up, Chartel? We think they've left. I said, I'll be down to see you at first light. First light, I'm down there. It's funny. It's springtime. Not a footprint anywhere out there in the office. Apparently the apple trees in the orchard were moving around. <laughs> we were that scared. Yeah, sure. Uh, 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 and, uh, we were scared to death. We really were. The other story, Sergeant Perry, one of my best non-cons, uh, visited him during the day. Captain, every evening, every morning rather, about three o'clock, we hear clop, 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 creak, creak, creak. The Germans were reduced to using horses and wagons because the Air Force had ruined their petroleum industry. And uh, he said, just like clockwork, three o'clock, uh, we have no idea what it is. So we had Sergeant Perry fire some test shots uh, into the bank that was on the far side of the road on the far side. And uh, uh, we got the mortar platoon that, that, that we had been given. and. Uh, they fired a couple of practice mortars, but
but they could fire parachute flares. So uh, three o'clock, right on schedule. Creek, 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 clop, clop, clop. Fire the mortars, daylight. Horses and wagons. Six ammunition trucks. It was the 4th of July uh, in March. Uh, all of a sudden I hear, on the, hear General Burris's voice on the radio, Graham, what in the hell is going on? <laughs> uh, uh, the Sergeant Burry, uh, so that's Perry, rather, got the bronze star, should have. But anyway. After Heilbronn, it was pretty much a piece of cake. Um, we uh, were given one fruitless job of capturing a bridge over the Danube River and Ulm, U-L-M, a fairly major city. Uh, it blew up when we got to about 50 yards from it. The Germans saw us and up it went. But the engineers had a new bridge by daylight the next morning. They were great. And uh, then it really was a piece of cake. Uh, we did some shooting, but very, very little. Uh, another story. We were to take Ober Amigau, where they have the Passion Play. Beautiful city. And uh, I've forgotten what regiment we were attached to, but I had a report to the, the colonel in charge of it. And uh, he said, Captain, um, I attended the Passion Play at Ober Amigau in 1930, and I think of it as being a holy city. I do not. Now, Captain, I'm going to repeat that. I do not want a shot fired in that town. Do I make myself clear? <laughs> yes, sir. So I passed it on to the guys who were overjoyed, of course, and we got to Ober Amigau. <laughs> And they pissed in the street. They what happened? <laughs> they pissed in the street. <laughs> they couldn't shoot, but by God, they were gonna they were gonna give the, the girl yeah. the finger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were there lined up waiting for orders as to where to go next, which happened to be garbage part in Kirsten. And uh, Hey, Captain, some kraut woman wants, wants to talk to you. Bring her down. Introduced herself as Mrs. Lang, the wife of Antoine Lang, who played Christ in the Passion Play. Uh, and she was the owner of the Lang Hotel. And thank you for liberating us. Would you and your officers like to join me at the hotel for a glass of wine? I said, no, we, we, we'd like to see the hotel, but we are duty and we can't drink. The guys were drinking, but we weren't. Uh, with that, all, all the wine they got at Boishta. Uh, and uh, uh, lovely, lovely woman. Janet and I went back there at 1979 to see the, the Lang Hotel closed for repairs. Oh. It was a real disappointment. But uh, we continued on to Garmisch Park in Kirchen, which is where they had had the Winter Olympics in uh, 36, I think. <laughs> and uh, then over the Austrian border into Innsbruck, and uh, then through the Brenner Pass uh, into Italy, uh, where we were to meet the Fifth Army. Uh, we were given a, a battle star for the Battle of the Po Valley, but we never fired a shot. But we, we, didn't, we didn't turn down the five points toward, re, uh, uh, toward retirement, right. uh, toward re, the discharge, rather. Uh, but that was the end of the war for us. And uh, we went back up. Was and, there any uh, sort of celebration when VE Day was announced? Uh, do you uh, remember that day? The Germans had surrendered to us um, about five days before VE Day. Uh, that was when we met the Fifth Army. Uh -huh. Uh, so we were clean uniforms, we had had a bath uh, uh, when VE Day was actually announced. And uh, I guess we were with the 103rd Infantry then. So we had a parade uh, to celebrate VE Day down the Marienstrasse 
in Innsbruck. And uh, I was all right. Um, our tanks would have torn up the Marienstrasse if the whole battalion, all 83 tanks, had, had gone down there. So the, company, the, the colonel had a composite tank site. I think he had about three tanks from A Company, B Company, C Company, none from D Company. So I had about nine tanks, but he put me in charge of it, uh, uh, which I was honored. Uh, and uh, again, another story. Um, you, you can't see your driver when you're in a, in a Sherman tank. I was used to the little ones, the, the Stuarts. Uh, uh, and uh, I didn't know that my driver, instead of having his helmet liner on, had a mechanic's cap with, with the, the bid turned up, and he was smoking a cigar. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the parade, the colonel lost a cigar. Oh. He lost the pappy on the back. Wouldn't I get chewed out? <laughs> <laughs> But that was the end of the war. Uh, we were in occupation, I think, about three weeks. Uh, I was the town commander in a little town called Niederbetsch, no, that was in France, uh, Bildermini, uh in Austria. And uh, God, I, I didn't run the town, the village priest and the former mayor, the pre-Nazi Burgermeister, the three of us got together and we did what we could to maintain order and there was no problem. The, the uh, local people treated my guys great. Okay. And uh, except for one incident, my guys treated the uh, local people wonderfully. And the one incident of which I am ashamed uh, the burgomaster and the village priest came into my office, red-faced. Come on, come on, come on. Uh, I could speak uh, reasonable German in those days, thanks to NYU. Uh, and uh, we went to the priest, to the church rather, and there were human bones on the altar. Where they got them? Why they put them on the altar, which is terrible. Uh, I don't know, but the first thing I felt was shame. And uh, my first sergeant was with me and I said, Sergeant Rank, get the company, light them up outside. And they were there. I let them stay there for a while. And I walked out of the church with the bones in my arm. Well, now how did they know that uh, it was one of the guys from your company? Almost bound to have been. Oh. The, the village. The, the villagers wouldn't have done. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, and uh, uh, I stood for probably 30, 40 seconds. Uh, while they were out of tension, I didn't put them at ease. I was ticked off. I said, I don't know who did this, but whoever did it has disgraced D Company, they've disgraced the 781st, they've disgraced the United States Army, and they've disgraced America. And they should be ashamed. I could administer company punishment, but I want you guys to find the guy that did this and you do the job yourself. Hmm. Uh, about four days later, Sergeant Ray said, Captain, the bone thing, <laughs> it's been taken care of. The way you think it should be, Sergeant? Yes, it was, Captain. <laughs> Very positively. <laughs> Never saw any bruises, but somebody got beaten up. <laughs> and should have. I was ashamed of that. The following Sunday, I had, with huge help from the priest and the burgomaster, I went to church in my dress uniform, and when it came time for, for the gospel, really, at the Roman Catholic Mass, I had it written out, and I had read it and read it, so my NYU German came in handy, and I apologized to the priest, to the people. Uh, after the arrogance that they had seen in the German officers, to have an American officer say, I'm sorry, 
they hugged me. Uh, and uh, we got along with them. But we were gone about a week later uh, and uh, had the luxury of uh, a, a 40 and 8 uh, from uh, Innsbruck to La Havre, France. And, and a 40 and 8 is what, 40 men and 8 horses is yes, the size yes, of, yeah, the, of the boxcar? Those cockroach ridden, <laughs> vermin ridden uh, freight cars that they yeah. have in France. Yeah. They were awful. Yeah. And we ended up at Camp Lucky Strike uh, near La Havre. My brother was in La Havre. Uh, Were you aware of that at the yes. time? Oh. And he was in the port battalion, uh, where he would unload the lighters that would be brought in in the absence of peers and, 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 uh, and any other hit. The Lahar had been destroyed. Mm -hmm. And I remember being introduced to his colonel, uh, who, who called Colonel Kitty and invited all the 781st officers. Uh, to come in for a beer bust uh, while we were waiting for a ship to take us home. Oh boy, keg of beer, baseball game, into their officers club, open bar. These guys who had been in combat for seven months hadn't seen any booze except for the stuff that we stole. <laughs> uh, we took that place apart. <laughs> it, it was quite a night. <laughs> uh, but shortly after that we were, I've forgotten the name of the ship, um, and uh, on our way back home. I don't know what port we landed in. I keep thinking that it might have been Newport News, Virginia. I'm not sure. Got a nice reception. Nothing like we had the other day on, uh, from thanks to the honor flight. Um, all the ships in the harbor had their horns going. Oh, wow. Uh, the fireboats had the, the water going way up in the air. And the factories on, on the, uh, were all blowing their whistles. And uh, when they put us on the train that was on the pier waiting for us, just the minute we got off the, uh, the pier, the engineer began to give it this, but all the way, I think we went to Camp Patrick Henry, I think. Well, either that or A.P. Hill. And uh, I remember a colonel uh, greeting us, saying, welcome back to the United States. Thanks for the job you guys did. Uh, men, we've got a special request for you. You're in a United States Army post. When you see an officer, will you please salute? <laughs> <laughs> As you know, we didn't salute yeah. over there. And we had our bars painted on the backs of our helmets so that we couldn't be yeah. seen. Uh, uh, but that was the end of the war. Uh, now, uh, was there any uh, concern or any uh, thought of sending you guys to the Pacific? or had the, uh, We were back for that. Uh, we were to be re-equipped and retrained to go to Japan. And we were given a 30-day, they called it recuperative leave. We had little to recuperate from other than it would have been nice to have had a couple of days off and we had. The bomb was dropped toward the end of that recuperative leave. And uh, my then wife and I were flying back to uh, Louisville for, to, so that I, we could go to Fort Knox for that retraining. And uh, we had just passed the New York skyline in the DC-3 when the captain burst out of the cabin, the Japs have quit. Oh, wow. And uh, what few people were in those little tiny planes went wild. But I got to admit, one tank captain cried. And I'm not the least bit ashamed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, it's over. Oh, wow. Uh. And I cried Sunday. That was a four handkerchief day, I'll tell you that. <laughs> it was. Uh, Great. Yeah. The yeah. other flight people were, was the most emotional day yeah. I have had in my adult life. Wow. Uh, wow. Yeah. The other flight people are great. Yeah. Well, uh, before we move ahead then to your post four years, I'd like to go back and just ask you a few questions about uh, your experience that you just talked about. 
Talk about life as a tanker. What was what was it like in a tank? Can you describe the conditions and, and as you guys were going across Europe, uh, just talk about daily life as far as your living conditions, you know, the food. Uh. Living conditions were miserable. Uh, in France, for the most part, we we would try to look for a blown up blown apart house, and we would move into there for some protection. Uh, food, they got to us pretty darn consistently. Uh, it, it was hardly what you would get at the plaza in New York, uh, but uh, it was wholesome. Uh, during the bulge, we had nothing but boxed food, K rations or C rations, mostly K. Uh, so we really didn't have a hot meal uh, for about 30 days. And that was, uh, to add to that, that was uh, one of the coldest winters in, in, oh, in European history. In 40 years, yeah. yeah. Uh, it was miserable. In Germany, uh, we didn't look for the bombed out places. We were not very nice. Knock on the door, save Minuten, or us. Uh, we just kicked them out of their homes and yeah. we moved in. Uh, that's what they did. Sure. Uh, and uh, they got a taste of their own medicine. Uh, so uh, kind of ashamed of that. <laughs> it's war. That was war. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the living conditions got better toward the end of the war. Uh, the end of the war was almost a picnic. The Ober Amagao garbage party here uh, uh, But I very seldom was in a tank. Uh, the uh, Light tanks, the M5A1, uh, it was a four man crew driver, assistant driver, gunner, tank commander, loader. Uh, and I could be a loader, a tank commander, and command of the tank. Sure, crew. yeah, right. So for the most part, I rode in a Jeep. A bit exposed, but I actually felt safer in it. I don't know why I, uh, I really did. And I didn't do it for the safety. I did it for the communications. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I had my radio and what have you. We lived better than the infantry. Those poor guys uh, living in foxholes. And every now and then we did sleep under the tanks. But it was better than a foxhole. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, you, you talked about, was it, you said you had, what, three days off in that seven months of uh, combat? Yeah. <clears throat> as I look at it, as you just describe those seven months, I mean, you're out in the elements, in the cold elements, you were, uh, probably weren't eating properly, hygiene probably wasn't proper, uh, you probably weren't getting enough sleep. Any one of those, I think, would not, could knock a man down, but on top of that, you had the, the stress of war on top of it. How do you think you, you've, you functioned through those seven months. And, and, and on top of that, with you in particular, how did you keep your men going uh, during that? We kept going. Uh, maybe it was our training. Uh, uh, there was extreme privation, yes. Uh, but you expected it, and you put up with it. Uh, and basically, you lived with it. Uh, that's the best answer I can give you. Mm. Uh, we uh, didn't feel that we were enjoying life tremendously, and, and the, the fear was more than anything else. Well, that, that was going to be my next question here. You know, I'm a person that has never been in combat, doesn't even have the slightest idea what it's like uh, being in combat and having 88s fired at you. Uh, how does a person function in that? Situation. Even when you weren't eyeball to eyeball with, with the with the Germans, they were the, the artillery, uh, and it was coming in all the time. Boom! Uh, and uh, you you just dive under the tank or dive wherever. Uh, wow. Uh, wow! And that was frightening. Hmm. Wow. And what about uh, communications? I mean, in today's world, we've got cell phones and internet and such. Talk a little bit about uh, communications back home and and uh... female, uh, the specially prepared mail that you could 
fold into a, a very small envelope. What well, wasn't it? A, it, it was a self, self envelope. It, it wrapped itself up. And it was made especially small to keep from taking up too much space. There, there were, after all, hundreds of thousands of letters every single day. We, of course, had a sense of the mail. Right. Yeah. And, and we did. And uh, sometimes the guys were pretty explicit about where they were, and that got etched out or cut out. And uh, I think I got a letter a week from my wife. Uh, my father was really good about and there was a letter every week from him, uh, my brothers and sisters uh, wrote consistently. We heard from them. And that was, uh, uh, particularly with you guys on the move all the time, the mail kept up with you pretty good? Uh, not all that well, yeah. but so every now and then you end up with seven letters. Uh, yeah. But uh, you got them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah. That's the important thing. And they got your mail. Yeah, yeah. How they did it, I don't know, but yeah. they, they sure did. And the food wasn't all that bad. Uh, uh, during the bulge, it was awful. But uh, uh, Thanksgiving Day, we had turkey. Christmas Day, we had turkey. Mm. <laughs> and uh, you, you got it in, out of a mess kit. Uh, and uh, we, we had champagne that somehow or other we found. Champagne out of, the, out of the canteen cup. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, obviously, war is very stressful. But I, I would think, as as an officer, it had to be more stressful for for you because you had uh, the welfare of your men to think of. Uh, any thoughts on that? I mean, did did you lose any men? Uh, yeah. The men never saw me cry, but I did. And when Sergeant Williams got killed. He was our senior non-com. He was the platoon sergeant for the second platoon. Came to, to the 781st as part of the cadre, uh, where he came from a Virginia, West Virginia National Guard outfit. Married, three kids. Nice guy, real leader, uh, and. Uh, a bazooka hit his tank, and that was the end. Uh, uh, and uh, I think that's the only time a man ever killed a prisoner. Uh, I hope it was. Um, they went down the line of the capture of the captives. We made that. Did you fire the bazooka? Did you? Yeah. Real proud. He didn't last 15 seconds. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't say a word. Uh, I should have, but I didn't. Uh, because he killed Sergeant Williams, damn it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Hmm. Well, uh, uh, we, we didn't have all that much to complain about. Yeah. The, the Army did the best it could to keep us comfortable, warm, and fed. and. Uh, under, shall I say, trying conditions. And uh, I'm surprised they did as well as they did. Yeah, yeah. No complaints. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you've mentioned a couple times, so you, you went off uh, to Europe, you were married then. You had married? Uh, yes, yes. And uh, with one child. With one child? Yeah, oh, geez. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that had to add to uh, everything else on top of it. Married? I mentioned Mr. and Mrs. Pito, who was so nice to Ed McAllister, Ken McNichol. I married their niece. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> I didn't meet her, however, until I got out of OCS, until I became an officer and a gentleman <laughs> by act of Congress. That <laughs> <laughs> was kind of a whirlwind romance. It, a marriage that should never have happened, mm -hmm. uh, although we had another child later. A plantation born spoiled girl married a Yankee, yeah, a Catholic, it, right. uh, a New Yorker, yeah, right, yeah. A, str a struggling insurance underwriter who wasn't making all that much money, uh, so it ended up in divorce. Okay. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, I did end up with the children. Uh, 
before she left them and left me to marry the guy that she had been seeing while I was overseas. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, a, that's a dull point in the life. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Happier times came later. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll move on to then to those happier times. Um, so take your, so uh, you're back, uh, back to the States. Uh, uh, the war is over. How much longer then uh, before you were uh, uh, let out of the service after? Discharged on the 9th of October, 45. 45, okay. Among the first to go. The war was over in June. Mm -hmm. uh, so within 60 days, uh, they had gotten the me mechanics to, to discharge everybody. Uh, Camille Pelletier, the A Company commander, incidentally, his father was the conductor of the Metropolitan Opera's Royal Orchestra. Uh, Pelletier sounds musical. Uh, and Cam Pelletier was just a peach of a guy. Mm. After the war, he invited my then wife and me to visit him at his dad's apartment on Park Avenue. Uh, and uh, got out of the taxi cab. Uh, I was in civilian clothes, but uh, the doorman said, you're Captain Graham? Uh, yeah, this way, please. Go in the, go, go, by the, go by the elevator. And he pushes a button in the wall, and the wall opens. <laughs> Up we go to the penthouse. Wow, uh, that was quite an easy. Uh, but uh, Cam and I were the first ones discharged. And, uh, should have been we it were in before the war. Sure, no, absolutely. Uh, I don't know how many points I had, but it was more than twice what was needed to to get out. And uh, moved to Long Island, Stewart Manor, which is where my brother lived. And from one site, went to be drafted, and uh, bought a home. It was half a duplex for $5,000. Uh, Were you able to take advantage of the GI Bill? To the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure that we put anything down. Uh, the Franklin Square National Bank had the mortgage, and they sent flowers when we moved in. <laughs> Times have changed. <Yeah. laughs> Made a killing out of it when I sold it, however, uh, about a year and a half later. Made, sold it for 6100 <laughs> But I did not go back to the Travelers, uh, where it took me nine months to find a permanent job with the Travelers before the war. Uh, the insurance staffs were decimated by the war. They didn't have anybody. So anybody that had any experience at all, they would jump at you. Uh, and. Uh, I think I, wherever I went, I got a job on mm. uh, Not because I was Joe Graham, Mr. Hotshot. Yeah. I was a human being uh, with some experience. And uh, uh, I ended up choosing the insurance company in North America. Uh, why? A customer of mine before the war, Ashley M. Losey, uh, an insurance broker, whom I respected. I went to him and said that <coughs> I like the travelers, uh, but I think I should look around. Uh, I should be doing the best I can for me and myself, for myself and my family. He said, go to the insurance company in North America. They got a guy by the name of John Diamond, who took the company over about three years ago. Uh, it's the wealthiest country company in America. It's a sleeping giant. And uh, I shouldn't use this language on the tape, but I'll quote Mr. Losey. He's kicking them in the ass, uh, and he's going to make a real organization out of it, which is exactly what happened. And uh, uh, I joined INA uh, at the, uh, in their New York City office with a bunch of men who really knew the insurance business. And uh, it helped me tremendously. Uh, the that Franklin Vanderbilt who ran it, and Ted Fields, the assistant manager, 
and uh, Eddie Farr and Ed Marshall taught me the insurance business and uh, it helped me. And uh, I moved on to Cleveland, uh, became the assistant manager there later. Uh, and uh, there I met my wife. I divorced my first wife mm -hmm. and was a single parent uh, with uh, my son Bill and my daughter Betty. And uh, met Janet Collins in the insurance business and I could not have asked. For a better wife. Wow, wow. And we have three more children. Um, after about a year of being assistant manager in Cleveland, uh, my boss, Bill Watson, he want to see you at the, at the home office. Um, why, Bill? Uh, so we went downstairs to the bar. Uh, come on, Bill. Why do they want to see you? They're going to give you an office of your own. Could be one that bigger. But, um, where? Oh, I can't tell you. And he didn't. <laughs> so, honey, went to Philadelphia. Come. You're going to be, off of, you're going, you're going to be the manager of Indianapolis. Uh, one of the smallest offices in the company. Uh, but I was the youngest assistant manager. And uh, my boss, uh, Reg Robbins, shoved the phone across the desk. He said, I'm sure you're going to want to talk to your bride. And he stayed. Well, that, that kind of silt, your, your, your conversation with your wife, he said, honey, we're going to be treasured. I know that. Where? And I'm going to be a manager. I know that. Where? <laughs> In the Annapolis. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> Janet spoke her mind. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, we were there for just one year. The office was a mess, but easy to fix. And it was fixed. Philadelphia was to see the home office. Uh, and uh, they gave me San Francisco. And I called her. Honey, we're moving again. I, uh, I figured, where to? San Francisco. Honey, please don't kid me. Where are we going? <laughs> Great move. And, uh, and the office was a senior grade mess. Nobody worked. Nobody kept office hours. Uh, they were as relaxed as they could be. And they were losing money left and right. And uh, I remember the office hours. I was there about three weeks. And I called a meeting and said, uh, I've got a problem. I come here 20 after 8, which is the home of the and I'm lonesome. And I don't like to be lonesome. <laughs> anyway, that and the drinking, uh, uh, I had a behavior problem to handle, uh, not just an insurance problem. And goodness knows we had that too, uh, but it, it took a while. And uh, four years later, we got the office best record in the company. Wow! Wow! With a new staff. Yeah. <laughs> That's completely new. Uh, my bond department, run by Jim Smith, odd name, uh, <laughs> unbelievable. A man, probably eighteen years my senior and who helped me tremendously get to be a halfway decent manager. Uh, he said, Joe, talk to him. By God, he's right. Uh, uh, and George Haig, his assistant. Um, Jim still had seven or eight years before retirement, and George wanted to move up, but he couldn't move up with Jim there. So he and I used to spend every Monday Monday evening, um, 
and I was teaching him the public liability business, with which I was reasonably skilled. And uh, well, to make a long story short, he ended up as an assistant manager in charge of public public liability. Great guy. I still see his widow, all oh, about every three months. Uh -huh. uh, I go across the East Bay and. Evelyn and I have lunch. And we bitch about the pension and <laughs> <laughs> old times. Yeah, yeah. And I go home. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, she's a lovely lady, and he was a fine, fine man. Uh, I had a good career with yeah. that. Forty-four years, she said, uh, in, yeah, in the business. Uh, wow. Um, I was transferred from San Francisco, uh, where I had been the regional manager. Uh, to take over a company in Los Angeles, a subsidiary. It had two offices, and my edict was, they're losing money, make it profitable, and we want a nationwide company. It was a, in a completely different niche of the insurance business. We were known as excess and surplus lines brokers, not underwriters, which is what I was before. Uh, and. Uh, an excess and surplus lines broker handles business which is either too big for the regular markets, uh, either in whole or in part, uh, uh, too specialized, unusual malpractice or wave loss coverage on a pier sticking up the Lloyds of London kind of business, okay. uh, uh, or not wanted, bad. Uh, uh, substandard fire insurance business, vacant buildings and things like that. Uh, so uh, I had that job for 10 years and uh, we made money and there were 23 offices when I left. Wow. Uh, and uh, frequently Janet would help me with it. Uh, I lost three secretaries to death, would you believe? One was murdered. Uh, she was 67 years old, and the youngest victim of the West Side Rapist in Los Angeles. Uh, when we found her body, and we did, uh, it was a terrible day. Mm. And, uh, she was a wonderful woman. Yeah. Uh, mm. And Janet would fill in. Wow. She said the only reason I asked her to help was that they gave me a chance to get fresh with the help. <laughs> 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 uh. But Janet and I were married in Cleveland. Uh, and uh, that's where Patty was born, followed by Jack, who lives here. Uh, and. Uh, Tom was born in Indianapolis, uh, and uh, then we decided that that was enough. Yeah, uh, five. Five. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and they've been great kids. Excellent. Regretfully, Betty and Bill are both gone, uh, but the other three are still here. Mm -hmm. And grandchildren, great grandchildren. Uh, yes, eleven grandchildren, <laughs> and. Uh, Eleven and three ninths great grandchildren. Uh, there's one in the oven. But number twelve is in the oven. Oh, <laughs> so, so twelve great then. Yeah. Yes. So we have twenty-two grandchildren of, of various sorts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh wow. And how long were you and Janet married then? Forty-six. Forty-six. Fantastic yeah. years. Wow. Um, She died in 97. She was a smoker, lung cancer. Mm. Uh, and uh, I was her caregiver. She didn't have any outside help. We were never closer. Mm. Uh, and uh, best job I ever had. Yeah, wow. wow. Well, uh, Joe, we'll start to wind down this interview. Um, is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about, or any stories that have kind of floated to the top as we've been talking here. So, so ideally, 
we, we've captured the story as best we can, or do you think we've pretty much captured it? I think we have. Yeah. I did well in the Army, thanks to Captain Billingsley, my recruit officer, uh, Colonel Kenny, who was a patient but demanding boss and a great teacher. I did well in business, thanks to Frank Vanderbilt, Ben Marsh, Ben Ed Marshall, Ted Fields, Eddie Fair, Fort Park, and many others. The boss I had in uh, Cleveland, uh, Nolan Pierce, when my first wife left me and the children, uh, he actually cried. Uh, I was an underwriter. Do you need a car to be an underwriter? Go to your desk and that's where you are. I got a company car. So you could take the kids out on the weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, I had more people help me. Uh, wonderful people. Uh, I, I just had one hell of a lucky guy. Well, I think, I'm sure in turn, you've helped a lot of people as well, though. Well, I tried. Yeah. I yeah. tried. Yeah. Uh, but it's been a good life. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, oh, people like Jack and Ginger. Yeah. Uh, treat the old man better than I deserve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the last question I always like to ask in these interviews, how do you think that period of time when you were in the service uh, played a role in your life, affected your life, changed your life? Or did it? Or was it just simply a chapter in your life that you went through? I'm glad I went through it. It helped me in business. It made me a leader in business. It, teach, it taught you administration, the lines of communication, uh, preparation, planning, execution. Uh, it, 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 it made me a good executive. And I think it made me a good father. Uh, Colonel Kinney was a father to all of us. Uh, he, he took us under his arm. And uh, uh, I'm indebted to the service wow. for uh, what it did for me and not for what I did to, for it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased and proud to have served. Wow. Uh, wow. Well, with that, we'll, we'll end the interview. I want to. Thank you for sitting down to tell your story, but uh, just as important, I want to thank you for your service to our country. It's a privilege, a real privilege. Thank you.